Okay, let's start. You're all, all very welcome. Since uh, 2010, the Institute for Housing and Urban Research at Uppsala University has arranged the annual lecture in urban and housing research. Earlier speakers uh, have been Susan Smith, Cambridge, Louis Vacan, Berkeley, Sharon Sukin, Brooklyn College, and Gary Stoker from Southampton. Now, for the fifth annual lecture, this list will be extended by another distinguished scholar, Professor Ed Glacier from Harvard University. Uh, I th it's hard to briefly introduce someone who writes papers in approximately the same pace as I read them. Um, Ed's research spans a wide variety of areas and, and topics. Uh, he has made pioneering work in the, f in the fields of urban and housing economics. And in his research, he has, to give just a, a few examples, increased our understanding of what makes cities rise and fall, what, uh, what are the causes and consequences of a segregating housing market, how to understand poor or, in other ways, disadvantaged neighborhoods, how geographic proximity between individuals and firms uh, help in creating um, innovations and in spreading knowledge, and of how to understand price setting and price dynamics in the housing markets. Today, uh, Ed will, under the title The Urban Century, an Urban World, speak for approximately 45 minutes, then we will open up the floor for questions and comments. We are very honored to have you here and look forward to your talk. Please, Ed, the floor is yours. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mats, and thank you all for giving me... Uh... <laughs> thank you all for giving me 90 minutes of your time. I, um, uh, I'm really very honored at having the chance to give the, this fifth annual Urban Lecture, and I, I'm even more delighted at the prospect of, of learning from you about, uh, about cities. Um, let me start with a, a picture of America. Um, what I've done here in this picture is I've taken the 3,000 or so counties in the United States, and I've ordered them on the basis of their density levels. I've split them up then into tents. Each one of those dots represents 300 odd counties in the United States. And as you can see from the bottom line, I'm showing the relationship between density and earnings per capita GDP. Um, what you can see from this line is a monotonically increasing rate that shows that the densest tenth of America's counties have earnings that are on average 50% higher than the least dense half of America's counties. This is a pervasive feature found throughout the world. I'll show it to you for the European Union in the next, next graph. It's even stronger in many of the cities of the developing world. And it's a phenomenon that economists call agglomeration economies. Now, when you see a relationship between density and earnings or density and productivity, there are, of course, many different interpretations. It could be, as I'm going to suggest in this lecture, that this is actually a treatment effect of density, that we actually become more productive by being thrown into the maelstrom of economic activity that occurs in our densest uh, areas. But on the other hand, it could be that smarter people just choose to come to Stockholm right? Uh, you know, certainly many New Yorkers are prone to believe that they were endowed by their creators with a certainly, uh, uh, you know, extraordinary gifts. Or perhaps it is that there are features of a particular area, a port, a coal mine, that actually make it productive and attract people. Now, there has been a vast literature over the past 50 years trying to isolate these facts, and I'm not going to go through it fully now. But much of the work on dealing with the selection problem has focused both on measuring variables, including things like standardized test scores and showing that the selection didn't seem to be very large, but also looking at migrants who come to cities. And one of the things that's really interesting that when you look at migrants, you don't see that they have huge wage gains immediately, but what you see is that year by year, month after month, they have faster wage growth. And typically, they take that wage growth with them when they leave cities, which is hard to interpret as being a, just a selection 
model, which would tell you that they shouldn't experience any effect, but it's also not really compatible with the port model either, because if it was just access to coal mines, then shouldn't you get that immediately when you show up, go up in the, in the coal area? I'm not going to span more of this literature, but certainly I can, I can say that I'm fairly convinced that at least some fraction of this right, ref reflects the core productivity benefits of, of cities. Um, and these effects are quite large, right? The, the three largest metropolitan areas in the United States, New York, Los Angeles, and Chicago, produce 18% of America's GDP, while including only 13% of, of America's productivity, which is another way of saying that if all of America saw its per capita GDP levels rise to those seen in New York metropolitan area, America would be 42% richer. Um, now, the top line, this red line, shows a fact that may be slightly more surprising to you which is the relationship between population growth and population density. So what this shows is that those places that were initially denser, as of 2000, had the faster growth between 2000 and 2010. So whereas Americans at the start of the 1800s were leaving their dense enclaves on the eastern seaboard to populate the empty spaces between the oceans, at the start of the 21st century, instead of spreading out, we're clustering in. These are exactly the same two graphs for the European Union. Now, the blue graph, which is GDP per capita, um, is in fact, it, it seems uh, like it's not as strong in the US, but it's actually much stronger because the axes are compressed. Whereas the top to bottom was about 50% higher in the US, this is 10,000, this is 30,000, so it's actually a two to three scale in terms of, of density. And you don't need to believe that all of this is just the sheer economic power of being in a dense area to believe that this is still an effect that is important, that is significant. Um, the top line shows it's somewhat bumpy, but again, shows a general pattern where people are moving to areas that, that are denser. Um, now, the next graph, the next graph shows the housing market phenomenon that America just experienced. And it shows the great housing market tsunami that came and swept through America. And what you're looking at here along the horizontal axis, along the x-axis, is the growth in prices between 2001 and 2006. What you're seeing along the vertical axis is the decline in prices between 2006 and 2011. And I want you to take three or four facts away from this graph. The first of which is the tremendously strong relationship between growth and decline. Um, now, it's normal in housing markets for areas that do spectacularly well over a five-year period to do poorly over the next five-year period. The typical coefficient is about 32 cents on the dollar. So every dollar an area goes up over a five-year period, it typically gives back 32 cents of that gain over the next five-year period. This is not 32 cent mean reversion. This is 95 cent mean reversion. This was a great wave that came and went. The second fact I want you to take away from this is to recognize the enormous heterogeneity of America during this time period. This was not a world in which all of America had a huge boom and a huge bust. There are a huge number of metropolitan areas that are up here that basically experience nothing, right? And whereas there are some places down here that had unbelievable swings in their, in their particular areas. So this heterogeneity is the second fact. The third fact I want you to take away from it is that there are points that are off the regression line. They're points that did unusually well or poorly. I want to highlight two, Phoenix and Las Vegas, the desert cities, the places that never should have had a price boom because these are places in which it is incredibly easy to build housing. If it is possible to build housing at $80 a square foot, right, and if there's essentially an infinite amount of land and no regulation, economics tells us that housing should cost $80 a square foot, or maybe that plus a little bit more, not $250 a square foot. And for most of the past 40 years, housing in Las Vegas cost $80 a square foot, and then all of a sudden it went up to 200, and then it came back down again to 80, 80 a square foot. A brief and temporary madness, if you will. Um, and then, of course, there's Detroit, and we're going to spend a little bit of time at Detroit. Detroit, of course, was the one boom, one city that managed to miss the boom and still experience the bust. Um, and, of course, there are the positive outliers. There's New York, there's D.C., and they're representative of a larger pattern about density and price growth. And this is price growth over the entire 1996 to 2012 period. What I've done here is I've ordered metropolitan areas on the basis of their density level yet again. And I'm using density because at their heart, cities are the absence of physical space between people. Cities are density, proximity, closeness. 
And what you can see here is that there's almost no price growth over this entire period in the least dense four-fifth of America's metropolitan areas. All of the price growth is happening, on average, in the most dense fifth of America's cities. Now, in some sense, this is a bit of a paradox. We live in an age in which we are told that distance is dead, in which we could all effortlessly telecommute in to whatever, from whatever woodsy spot appeals to our love of nature. And yet, in so many ways, in so many places, cities are, are more vital than ever. Thirty years ago, the cyber seers, the techno prophets, told us that all of these new technologies would lead us to occupy electronic villages or electronic huts and just dial it in, and that cities would be dead. And yet, that's not what happened. In so many ways, in so many places, cities are more vital than ever. And of course, anything that's happening for cities in the West, for cities in Europe, for cities in the United States, is dwarfed by what's happening in the cities of the developing world. Our species, just in 2007, crossed this somewhat momentous halfway point where more than 50% of humanity lives in cities. And while cities certainly have many detractors, Gandhi particularly among them, uh, I don't agree with him. Uh, and certainly when you look at the evidence, right, when you compare those countries that are more than 50% urbanized to those countries that are less than 50% urbanized, the more urbanized countries have on average incomes that are five times as high Right? and infant mortality levels that are less than a third. And again, I'm not claiming that this relationship is causal, but I know of no pathway for a country from poverty into prosperity that doesn't involve a certain amount of urbanization. Now, one way of seeing what, happened, what has happened is this graph. And what I've done is I've sorted all the countries in the world into income bins in 1960 and today, and of course I've corrected for changes in the value of the dollar, so that $1,000 is supposed to be the same amount in the two different time periods. And what I've done within each income bin is I've shown the share of countries that are at least one-third urbanized. One-third urbanized is a fairly you know, uh, arbitrary number, just meant to convey a certain amount of, of city existence. And what you can see, for example, is that both in 1960 and in 2010, about 80% of those countries with per capita incomes between four and $5,000 were one-third urbanized. It's the norm among such countries. Go to, go to three and $4,000, actually all of them in 1960 were more than one-third urbanized. Today, again, a little bit over 80%. But go down to the really poor places. Go down to those countries at the very bottom of the world's income distribution, places like the Democratic Republic of the Congo. What share of those countries were more than one-third urbanized in 1960? None. There was none. Because to be poor was to be rural, as it had been true throughout almost all of human history. Today, what share of these countries are more than one-third urbanized? 42%, 43%. Again, look at those countries between one and $2,000. Only one-fifth were more than one-third urbanized. Today, almost 60% are. This is a momentous change. It's not a change that is, in any sense, problem-free. Cities have downsides as well as upsides, and including contagious disease, crime, um, traffic congestion. Dealing with those downsides can require money and can require effective government, both of which are sadly lacking in places like Kinshasa. But again, I don't see any future in rural poverty. So as difficult as these things are, I think to me this makes the case that Investing in cities, getting cities right, I mean investing intellectually in cities, figuring out how to make the cities of the developing world more livable is one of the great and most important challenges of the 21st century. Seeing their problems cannot be an ex excuse for just saying that we're going to try and shut people out of the cities, because again, we've tried rural poverty forever, and it's not a great solution. Um, this is just a graph, and again, I, I don't mean to suggest any causality of this, but it should make us wary of people like Gandhi who seem to want to shut down urbanization. What I'm just showing you here is the graph among poorer countries, again, countries with incomes less than 5,000 in 1960. I'm showing you the relationship between urbanization and in 1960 and per capita income growth between 1960 and 2010. And as you can see, it's a, not a perfect relationship, but a robust positive one. Again, I don't in any sense suggest that this means that we should be pushing people into cities. In no part of what I'm, what I'm suggesting here suggests that I think that this is a, you know, a magic recipe that we should be forcing people to do. But it does at least suggest to me, when you look at a correlation like this, that you should be wary about policies that say, well, you know, I want to make sure I keep people on the farms. I want to make sure I don't allow cities to dwell because they've got you know, uh, downsides. Another way of thinking about this problem is 
just having respect for the decisions of poor people. It's often natural to look at the favelas of Brazil or to look at the slums of, of Mumbai and you say to yourself, these are just awful places. These poor people, wouldn't they be better, you know, just living at home on, on the farms? But if you look at the data of what the rural northeast of Brazil looks like, their decisions look perfectly rational because they didn't have the chance to live in Uppsala. Right? They weren't given the chance to live in some benevolent, you know, peaceful, prosperous country. Their alternative is pretty bloody awful, excuse me, is pretty bad. Right? And this alternative, they fled not because they were forced to most of the time, right? not because someone said you must leave and come to the city, but because they chose it. And that's the fundamental point about urban poverty, is that cities should never apologize for their poverty, because cities don't make people poor, at least not most of the time. Cities attract poor people. They attract poor people with the promise of economic opportunity, with a stronger social safety net, and with the ability to get around without a car for every adult in the United States or in Europe. My own work with Matthew Kahn finds that poverty rates go up near new subway stops. This does not mean that subway stops are in some way you know, bad. It means that they're doing exactly what you'd expect them to do, which is to provide a means of mobility for people who can't afford an automobile for every person in the household. Um, now, Another way that we can look at this, of course, is happiness, life satisfaction. Um, again, I, I don't believe at all that life satisfaction is you know, a, a perfect summary measure of anything. Uh, but certainly the, the anti-urbanites would, would accept the fact that cities may make you wealthier, but they tend to highlight the view that, yes, you're, but you're giving up on the beauties of rural living. You're giving up on how this wonderful, close community of living in a rural area. Now, first of all, anyone who makes this argument can't have been visiting the rural Congo any time lately. But um, the data doesn't really seem to support what they're suggesting. Because, in fact, there isn't a correlation between rural living and poverty in the poorer world. This is the cross-country correlation. One is the least urbanized places. Five is the most urbanized places. And this relationship still holds if I control for income as well. And this, I think, somewhat more tellingly, is the, the difference between rural and urban happiness and um, income. And the positive numbers gi give you that people are in the urban areas are saying that they're happier than people in rural areas. And what this shows you is that in wealthy places, I'm trying to see if I have Sweden here. Yeah, yeah. Actually, Sweden, Sweden urbanites say that they're happier than rural dwellers. Uh, it's, but it's small. It's a small, it's a small gap. Um, in New Zealand, it's very much the opposite. Um, but in wealthy countries, it's sort of some countries go one way, some countries go the other way. There isn't a big gap. In poorer countries, India, Ghana, Mali, Moldova, Rwanda, pretty much all of the poorer countries that I have, with two prominent exceptions, the urbanites say that they are much happier than the rural dwellers do. Okay, so it's not as if the people who live in rural India are saying that they're so happy relative to, to the urbanites. They're typically the reverse. There are two prominent exceptions, Iraq and Thailand. Uh, I highlight that this data comes from the years 2005 to 2007, where Iraq cities had certain negative shocks, which may have inflicted something on it. Uh, Thailand, I got no explanation except for the traffic in Bangkok. Uh, this is actually U.S. happiness, uh, and the U.S. has very little relationship between urbanization and, and happiness today. Um, New York actually is dramatically low in self-reported happiness, but that does give a little bit of a warning sign about using this, because in fact, as someone who grew up in, in New York City, uh, you know, I can tell you that no self-respecting New Yorker is going to tell an interviewer that they're so happy with their lives, right? It's like confessing that you're an idiot. Uh, so um, the, uh, a, I, I perhaps take as more relevant the revealed preference measure that New Yorkers are particularly unlikely to commit suicide, uh, which may indeed be a better measure of, of life satisfaction. But if you look across metropolitan areas, this is the relationship between long population growth between 1950 and 2000. The most pervasive fact is that people in declining cities are unhappy. It's not that people who are growing in cities are so happy, but the, there's a strong correlation between decline and unhappiness. And what's really interesting when you look back at historical data is these declining cities actually look like they were unhappy first and declined later. So it's actually not that the decline appears to be making them unhappy, but they appear to be unhappy because they were declining. They're, un, they're declining because they were unhappy, not unhappy because they were declining. Um, now, this rosy view of urban life that I've just given you, looks you know, incredibly different from the New York City of my youth, right? Um, and I'm incredibly honored today, actually, that my best friend from childhood, who is a Swede and is a faculty member at Uppsala, is actually here in this, in this, uh, in this theater, which is, which is great for me. Um, but my youth, these are two iconic images of the city. Gerald Ford did not actually say the words drop dead, 
but you know, most Americans think he meant it. And indeed, during those years, most people thought that not just President Ford, but history itself was telling New York to go ahead to the funeral parlor. Um, New York had been the largest industrial cluster, had had the largest industrial cluster in the United States in the 1950s. It was not automobile production in Detroit, it was garment production in New York City. And that industrial cluster was hammered by globalization, half a million jobs lost in a relatively short period of time. Um, accompanying this deindustrialization of the city was suburbanization, rising social problems, a spiraling crime rate, and a city that could not pay its bills. It went to the, city, to, to the federal government asking for a bailout, and President Ford understandably asked for more than, than the city was willing to, to give. Um, and it really looked as if New York's time had come and gone. And it wasn't just New York. It was Boston, it was Buffalo, it was Detroit, it was San Francisco, it was even Seattle, as I'll come back to, to later. All of these looked like places that were done. And that you'd be looking forward to a future where the, and you can see there Jimmy Carter wandering through the wasteland that the South Bronx had become. You were looking forward to a future in which the weeds were going to rise up and reclaim the once proud towers of our, our great metropolises. That we'd be looking forward to a future where the Statue of Liberty would come poking out of the, the sand like the end of the Planet of the Apes, one of those great uh, cultural episodes from my youth. Um, the, um, in some sense, cities seemed so, so finished, so over in the 1970s, because they had lost their original reason for being. This is, by the way, a slight historical interlude. Uh, the, um, the, the cities had lost their original being because all of America's older, colder cities had come about to solve a transportation problem. They were all nodes of a great network which enabled Americans to access the wealth of its hinterland. If you go back to 1816, it cost as much to move goods 30 miles over land in the U.S. as it did to ship them across the entire Atlantic Ocean. Okay? Um, it was that expensive to move goods over space. So Americans sat on the edge of this vastly wealthy continent that was, you know, uh, unaccessible. And yet, over the century, they built this amazing transportation network. First and most importantly, canals, and then railroads that supplemented those canals. And cities grew up on pinch points of that transportation network. Buffalo, the western terminus of the Erie Canal, the place in which Joseph Dart's pioneering elevators, and of course I, I, I have to point out that elevators are one of the greatest public transit devices ever invented for cities. Um, Joseph Dart's elevators lifted the grain that was being shipped east on the boats that were on the Great Lakes onto the canal barges that would take, take it on to New York City. Um, Chicago the linchpin of a great watery arc that went all the way from New York to New Orleans. I mean, every one of those 20 largest cities in the U.S. in 1900 was on a major waterway, from the oldest, New York and Boston, typically where the river meets the sea, to the newest, Minneapolis, on the northernmost navigable point in the Mississippi River. And, of course, industries formed around those transportation hubs, right? Chicago's paradigmatic industry were the stockyards. Now, the stockyards are fundamentally about solving the problem of moving corn. Okay? Um, America, then as now, has a remarkable comparative advantage at growing corn, by which I, I really mean maize, but you can throw in some wheat there, there as well. Um, the problem with corn is that it, it is a very low value per ton commodity. It is very expensive to ship. So typically throughout history, it has been transformed. The calories of, of corn have been transformed into something that is more portable. Initially, it was also transformed into something that was potable as well, because the farmers of western Chan Pennsylvania solved the transportation problem by transforming it into whiskey, right? And that's indeed what the Whiskey Rebellion of Pennsylvania in the late 1790s was all about. In the 1830s, the farmers of the Ohio River Valley transformed it into salted pork, because, of course, pigs are corn with feet. Right? And Cincinnati grew up as the city that was Amer referred to as America's Porkopolis, that was built on this, slaughtering the pigs, salting them, shipping them east. Now, Chicago's stockyards, which as you can see are built around beef, right, is moving the corn grown in the spectacularly fertile areas of, and there are about 50% more corn per acre is being grown in Illinois and Iowa than in the old Ohio River Valley during this time period. Spectacularly fertile areas transforming them into cows, not uh, pigs. Now, for some reason or other, human beings have always preferred 
uh, salted pork to salted cow. So one part of the cow revolution in transportation involves the transportation technology associated with this guy, Armour, which is refrigerated rail cars. So he figures out the basic puzzle that you got to, it's not him, it's an engineer he hires, but he, they put ice blocks on top of the, the, the cows instead of below them, and the cold water drips down, keeping the slaughtered, the slaughtered cows cold for the long journey, uh, journey east. And the industry, of course, then grows up around the stockyards. A similar process can be described in Buenos Aires at the same time period with the growth of the frigorificos, the refrigerated ships that will take Argentine beef again, part of moving Argentine wheat to European markets. Now, everything that I've said so far makes it sound as if cities are solving an operations research problem, that like some bureaucrat sitting in Stockholm or in the Pentagon could have figured it out, you know, this is where we're going to minimize the transportation costs by putting the stockyards and we're going to figure it all. And there's some truth in that. There's some part of cities that fit that. But there's also something magical that occurs when smart people come to connect with one another. It's what the English economist, the great English economist Alfred Marshall was talking about when he wrote that in dense neighborhoods, the mysteries of the trade become no mystery, but are, as it were, in the air. Right? And this ability to learn from people who are near to us was going on when Socrates and, and Plato bickered on an Athenian street corner, and it was going on when Mark Zuckerberg in, in engaged in conversations with the Winkelwey in Cambridge, and I hope I'm not saying anything that's legally actionable right now, uh, engaged in conversations with the Winkelwey that led to the creation of Facebook. Now, you know, some of the places in which you see these chains of brilliance most straightforwardly are in the arts. Right? So in 15th century Florence, a city built on wool and banking, you have this chain of brilliance that starts when Brunelleschi of the Dome figures out the mathematics of linear perspective, how to make two-dimensional pictures appear three-dimensional. He passes it along to his friend Donatello, who puts it in low-relief sculpture on the wall of Orson Michele, right? below a marvelous sculpture of St. George. He passes it along to Masaccio, the painter who puts it on the wall of Brancacci Chapel, you know, St. Peter finding a silver coin in the, in the belly of a fish, and you believe it has distance because of this idea that has moved from person to person. And as each person grabs the idea, they do something else that's special with it. It goes from Massaccio to Fra Filippo Lippi, that very much less than saintly monk. It goes to Botticelli from, from Lippi and so forth. Each person getting the idea, each person riffing up from the idea, proximity enabling genius to become greater. Right? This is what cities do that matters. And this is what happened in Chicago in the 1880s, in this city based on stockyards, right? And of course, what Chicago gave us was this, the skyscraper, right? This thing which has come to symbolize what cities are. And this building, this picture here, is the home insurance building, often called the first skyscraper, meaning a tall building with a load-bearing steel or cast iron skeleton. And its architect, William Barangeni, is often known as the father of the skyscraper. But of course, there is a very lively architectural history debate about whether or not this is the first skyscraper or whether or not Jenny deserves this sobriquet, right? I mean, architectural historians, of course, will debate anything, and this one they're actually particularly right to debate. Because in fact, it isn't really a proper skyscraper. Only the front two walls have a load-bearing steel skeleton. The back two walls have traditional load-bearing walls, right? And indeed, they're also right that there were buildings with steel or cast iron skeletons going back decades before for industrial uses. There were ideas about building these, these buildings. There were plans for them that circulated long before, before Jenny. So does Jenny deserve the credit? Or perhaps Lewis Sullivan deserves it? Or perhaps Daniel Burnham? Or perhaps Adler? Or perhaps Root? Or perhaps the great fireproofing engineer who helped them all, Peter B. White? Well, I submit to you that the search for a father of the skyscraper is a fool's errand. Like pretty much anything else that our species has done that's worth anything, this was a collaborative invention. All of these people knew each other, they worked together. Lewis Sullivan and Burnham were both apprentices in Genty's office. They all stole ideas from each other. We are intellectual magpies. It is one of our greatest assets, our greatest traits, right? They shared inputs. It was the city of Chicago that enabled this thing to happen by bringing together all this talent in the wake of the Great Fire and then leading to the random interactions that led to the production of this remarkable technology that transformed the city. Now, a similar cluster of genius occurs in Detroit about 10 years later. Detroit, of course, is Detroit, the Straits, a great inland port that exists because of its waterways. And of course, Detroit would have industries like Detroit Dry Dock, 
uh, cutting edge company making boats that ply the Great Lakes using the most up to date engine technology available. Now, those engines would then provide a school training for young farm boys like this character, who's the young Henry Ford. And I told you earlier about how young people today come to cities and they become more productive as they, as they live longer in the city. Well, surely this happens to Ford, who comes to Detroit, starts working on engines uh, at Detroit Dry Dock, learns them, learns that he's very good at tinkering with them, moves to work for Thomas Alva Edison, and then as he grows a little bit longer, he joins in this great American quest to figure out the new, new thing, which in the 1890s is the mass-produced automobile, is figuring out a cheap automobile. And he returns to Detroit to do it, and he's very much not alone, right? It's a cluster of entrepreneurial genius, very much like Silicon Valley in the 1890s, right? In the, very much like Silicon Valley in the 1960s. There's the Dodge brothers, the Fisher brothers, David Dunbar Buick, Ransom E. Olds, Billy Durant in nearby Flint, right? An automobile genius on every street corner. They all knew each other. They all stole each other's ideas. They all supplied each other with parts, with financing, right? This is how creativity works. And on one level, they were spectacularly successful. They were successful in providing mobility for ordinary Americans. Farmers who previously were isolated could now drive around in their Model Ts. They were spectacularly productive in providing $5 day wages for workers who had never dreamed of such a thing. And they were spectacularly productive in making Detroit for a while what it was surely the most productive place on the planet, right? Whose work workplaces managed to help America to, to play its, its role in World War II even. Um, but while Henry Ford's model was a great model for static, for short-run urban resilience, it is a terrible model for long-run urban dynamic success. Okay? Successful cities at the start of the 19th century were marked by three things. Small firms, smart people, and connections to the outside world. The same three things mark urban success today. How far away from that is Henry Ford's River Rouge? A vast, vertically integrated factory walled off from the outside world, employing tens of thousands of people without even a college degree. It's not that this isn't a great factory, it's just that this is not a great urban enterprise. This, this enterprise doesn't need the city, it doesn't give to the city, it isn't porous, it isn't linked with other firms in the city, right? And this type of factory will just move to minimize production costs. And when technologies change, you just move the thing away. So in 1920, Detroit was a perfectly sensible place to put a huge factory because the transportation costs still mattered and you wanted access to the Great Lakes and the rail networks. By 1970, those transportation costs had plummeted. And this is just one way of looking at it. This is the change in the price of moving a ton a mile by rail in real dollars over the 20th century. That's a 90% reduction in the cost of moving goods over space in just by rail alone, not even including the changes created by trucking or other forms of transportation. Right? So whereas you were tied to the Great Lakes or tied to the rail lines in 1920, by 1960 you could move to lower cost locales, places which had lower wages. And that's exactly what production industries did. They moved first to the suburbs, but then they moved to low cost states. The work of Tom Holmes at the University of Minnesota does this very nice work comparing counties on pro-business and pro-labor states, counties that are right next to each other, and finds that after 1947 there was wildly more industrial growth in those counties which had state governments that were pro-business as opposed to those counties that were pro-labor. Um, and of course these firms moved to lower cost countries across the Pacific and elsewhere. Accompanying, and this is the setting for the decline of cities in the 1970s, accompanying this deindustrialization was suburbanization. We have always built our urban spaces around the transportation technology that was dominant in the era in which they were being created. Our oldest urban spaces are all pedestrian spaces. Go to the, go to the heart of old Rome or even downtown you know, Boston or New York. Narrow streets, the streets often wind, right? The blocks are short. They work the way human beings walk, right? Then move to areas that are gridded. And grids, although they're ancient, going back to Mahenjadara, grids are particularly valuable with wheeled transportation because it's harder to turn those wagons around, and they become more ubiquitous by the 19th century. Then you go to streetcar suburbs, right? Suburbs built around railroads at the early part of the 20th century, right? All of these were sprawl of their kind. All of these were expansion of the cities, but they're different from the car in one fundamental aspect. All of these older forms of sprawl, from the horse-drawn omnibus to the elevated railroad, were involved some walking. They involved walking to get to the stop, they involved walking from the stop, and that fundamentally kept things at least moderately close. The car is different. 
It's point to point, right? It both enables vast amount of space to be consumed and requires vast amount of space to be operated. And as a result, when we rebuilt our cities around the car, we rebuilt them totally, right? Now, I'm an economist. I believe in choice, right? And I don't in any sense argue that, you know, uh, Americans should not or any other people should not have the right to live with cars if they want to. But the principle of, of economics, or at least the starting point, is that they should probably pay for the social cost of their actions, which means they should pay for whatever externalities are associated with driving or pollution, and they should not have subsidized transportation infrastructure that, you know, the federal government uses general tax revenues to essentially bribe people to drive longer and longer distance. And, this is, and that, that's exactly what the federal government has been doing, particularly during this current administration, which has been particularly assiduous at using general tax dollars to pay for highway infrastructure. Um, the work of Nathaniel Baum Snow of Brown finds that each new highway that cut into a metropolitan area after World War II reduced the central city's population by about 18% relative to the metropolitan area as well. So the move to car-based living is, I'll just show you a picture of car-based living as in Levittown or uh, the woodlands outside of Texas. <laughs> is the second phenomenon that cities have to face. Now, this decline of urbanization was particularly acute in the cities of the north. Because what declining transportation costs did was they enabled people to ro relocate from places that had a productive advantage dictated by nature to places that had a consumption advantage dictated by nature. So places with a productive advantage dictated by nature are places like Pittsburgh with its great coal mines. Places with consumption advantages dictated by nature are places like Los Angeles that have nice Mediterranean climates that feel nothing like nowhere near as cold as Detroit in the winter and nowhere near as humid in the, in the summer. And the rise of the consumer city, right, the rise of temperate, temperate climates, is probably seen most in the fact that there is no variable that better explains metropolitan area growth during the 20th century than January temperature. Right? Over and over again it shows up, and this is January temperature and population growth between 2000 and 2010. Now, there are multiple things going on there. The warmer states of the U.S. did tend to have more pro-business policies after World War II, particularly after the South got its act together after the Civil Rights uh, Revolution. Um, it's also about housing policies. You don't understand why Atlanta, Dallas, Houston, Phoenix, each added a million people as metropolitan areas between 2000 and 2010 without understanding how easy these places make it to mass-produce housing at an affordable level for ordinary Americans. And as much as it is common for Americans from East Coast cities to look and gaze with envy at Europe and look with disdain at, at Houston, we've got to remember that Houston does a heck of a better job at providing affordable housing for ordinary in income Americans than Paris does at providing or affordable housing for ordinary income, income Frenchmen. Um, this same move towards warmth shows up in the EU as well. This is exactly the same graph. I've split EU nuts regions into the fifths on warmth. The only difference is the cold places are actually losing population as opposed to just, just declining a little bit. It's true within every wealthy country. It's actually not true in poor countries. So apparently India is too poor to care about climate right now. And I mean, I don't mean necessarily you'd want warmth in India, but there's no, no finding that sort of climate variables show up. Okay, Mo hit with the move to sun and sprawl. This is what happened to the 10 largest cities in the United States. And this is the only figure that I'm going to show you that's not about metropolitan areas, which are these areas that surround cities, but actually about the cities themselves. So, so this carries both suburbanization and deindustrialization. Eight out of the 10 largest cities in the U.S. had lost at least 20% of their population between 1950 and 2010. Three of them, Cleveland, Detroit, and St. Louis, have lost at least a half of their population. They're urban disasters. And this is the Detroit in 1967, which is ablaze in the great great fire. And of course, Detroit's troubles aren't over. In the last year, it just declared bankruptcy. Um, now, the federal government's policies aimed at reversing urban decline weren't exactly helpful. One can argue, and I, I'm happy to take that line in one of the questions, that our national government in the U.S., and probably in Sweden as well, should worry much more about helping poor people than about helping poor places. But it is certainly true that the way America tried to help poor places was completely counterproductive, in part because it followed a Potemkin village strategy that thought that the real city was the physical city, not the humanity that is housed in the city. Now, the hallmark of declining cities is that they have an abundance of structures and infrastructure relative to the level of demand. More than 90% of the homes in central city Detroit were valued at significantly below construction costs 
even as late, even as early as 1980. It never made sense for the federal government to use urban renewal to subsidize new construction in Detroit. And it certainly never made sense for the federal government to load hundreds of millions of dollars to the city to build a people mover monorail. Okay, so I want you to notice something about this monorail. It is gliding over empty streets. You can send buses down Detroit streets at any speed you want. They're empty. It's a city built for 1.85 million people that now has less than half than that amount, right? The right strategy for Detroit for public transportation is buses. You have the infrastructure always there. But somehow or other, in the magic of a monorail, the story is told that this monorail will bring Detroit back, and somehow or other, the lines are, are drawn. And I don't mean to suggest that all trains are bad or that all monorails are even bad. Disney World appears to do quite well with it. But I do mean to suggest that any time you're sinking large-scale money into infrastructure, you want to assiduously apply cost-benefit analysis. And there is no way this thing was going to pass any co sensible cost-benefit analysis whatsoever. Now, luckily, the story of America's cities doesn't all end like Detroit, right? And Detroit's story is not over. Something, something good will, I hope, happen in Detroit. It's easy to forget now, but in 1971, two jokers put up a billboard on the highway leaving Seattle asking the last person to leave the city to please turn off the lights. Because Boeing had been cutting back on its jobs. And just as no one could imagine a Detroit with a smaller General Motors, no one could imagine a Seattle with a smaller Boeing. This is before Amazon, before Costco, before Microsoft, and Starbucks is at best the faint whiff of an aroma in somebody's nostrils, right? Detroit, it's, Seattle came back, but it didn't come back because of a monorail or because of urban renewal dollars. It came back because of entrepreneurs. It came back because of smart people who started new businesses that didn't even exist in 1971, right? I am struck by the fact that one of my predecessors at Harvard argued that Cambridge, Right? Cambridge would not possibly be able to survive unless the federal government came in and bailed out the candy industry that had once been the heart of Cambridge, the New England Confectionery Company. Of course, that, that building now houses a biotech company and is doing extremely well. But cities need to constantly reinvent themselves, and Seattle had the wherewithal to do that. Now, why did Seattle reinvent itself and Detroit didn't? In fact, if you look at the sort of human capital of the areas, both cities are right on the regression line, meaning that Detroit is doing exactly as well as you'd expect a city which has 12% of its adults have college degrees to do, and Seattle is doing exactly as well as a city that has one half of its adults with college degrees, right? They're both skills are destiny. And if you want to explain why some of American cities have rebuilt themselves and others have not, right, skills, whether in 1970 or 1940, or even measures of skill going back to the 19th century, do a remarkably good job of picking the winners and losers. This is one way of looking at this. This is just skills as of 2000 and population growth between 2000 and 2010 across America's counties. And as you can see, the most educated fifth of America's counties have average growth rates that are four times higher than the least educated three-fifths of America's counties, right? Enormously strong, strong relationship. This is per capita earnings, and again, you're going down from 30,000 up to 70,000 up here across America's population skills. And this is not just the fact that your skills make you more productive. This effect is much stronger than that. This is that having skilled neighbors makes you more productive. This is what economists, since the pioneering work of Jim Rausch in the early 90s, have called human capital externalities. The fact that having smart people around you makes you smarter. The work of Enrico Moretti, which is um, fairly sophisticated in terms of the way that it approaches this with statistically, it finds that as the share of adults in your metropolitan area with a college degree goes up by 10%, your wages go up on average by 8%, holding your years of schooling constant. Okay? Um, this, these effects have been found really everywhere. This is an Indian graph, again, showing percent BA and earnings residualizing for your own education. The effect is actually much stronger in India than it is in the US. Um, this is just a national thing, and I feel like I'm compelled to say this in Sweden. This is the relationship between PISA math scores and, and earnings, right? Countries should not expect in the 21st century to earn more than their skills should merit. There's no thing that I would worry about more in Sweden than the decline in PISA math scores over the past, the past 10 years. Um, okay, now one of the reasons why, why education matters so much, why historical education matters so much, is that people have increasingly sorted into areas with people who have education like themselves. 
So places that were initially skilled have become more skilled over time, which is part of why history matters so much in this. So what I'm showing you here is the share of the population with a college degree in 1940, and the growth in the share of the population with a college degree between 1940 and 2000. And what you can see here is a very strong positive relationship that the places that started with more skills have become only more skilled over time. Right? There's complementarity between people, and that has only become more important as skills have become more important. Now, one way to think about this, and I'm going to try and pull this, pull this together here, is in some sense this is captured by this, this image. And this is an image of the Wallace office at Bloomberg LLP. Um, and the Wallace office is interesting for a couple of reasons, one of which is it reminds us of Bloomberg's role in finance. Finance in New York, which plays a wildly outsized role in the city, right, at its height in 2007, 42% of the payroll in the island of Manhattan went to finance and insurance, right? Wildly important. Similar numbers show up for London. Um, the tendency of finance to be such an oversized share of big cities should be a little worrying to those cities. The history of one industry towns are not great. But on the other hand, we shouldn't be surprised by them. Because, in fact, there's no industry in which being a little bit smarter can make you a fortune quicker than in finance. Okay? And if the great advantage of cities in the 21st century is the ability to spread knowledge, is the fact that the same proximity once got hogsheads onto clipper ships that now works to make us smarter by being around other smart people, then naturally finance goes to cities. The Bloomberg office, though, is interesting for another reason, which is that Bloomberg is part of a chain of invention in finance that starts with a more sophisticated ability to think about risk and return, which starts in the halls of the social science building with Jimmy Savage and Milton Friedman in the 1950s, and then gets moved by Harry Markowitz and Sharp to, to the sort of pure finance angle. It gets carried, embodied by people like Jack Trainer and the young Fisher Black to Wall Street. Right? That ability to think in a more sophisticated, quantitative way about risk and return then enables the young Michael Milken to, when he's still in New York, to, to jumpstart the junk bond industry, to convince investors that his securities carry enough return to offset the risk. Those junk bonds then enable the young Henry Kravis to engage in larger and larger leveraged buyouts, getting value out of underperforming American companies like uh, KKR and Nabisco. That transformation also involves securitization the spreading of mortgage risk throughout the system, for good or ill. And the founder of that, importantly, Lou Ranieri, gets his start in the Solomon Brothers mailing room, reminding us of the urban ability to sort of provide training for people who start with less. And of course, Bloomberg is part of that as well. His terminals, his data terminals, are part of this quantitative approach. There are two other reasons I like this, though. First, Bloomberg is an example of what Jane Jacobs talked about when she talked about the ability of cities to enable cross-industry leaps of entrepreneurial imagination. Bloomberg is not a financial billionaire. He's an information technology billionaire. But he's able to succeed in information technology, despite the fact that he's competing against the people in Silicon Valley, because he has the knowledge that New York has given him, because he has run the technology operation at Solomon Brothers, because he's run their trading floor, and he knows what the guys at Merrill Lynch want on their desk, something no Silicon Valley mogul could possibly know. That knowledge makes him much more competitive. That knowledge makes him a billionaire. Now, finally, there's a third reason I put this up, and of course, it's a physical geography. It's this Wallace office, which is based on the Wallace office at Bloomberg LLP, which is based on the Solomon Brothers trading floor. Now, when you think about trading floors, there's something puzzling. Here we have some of the wealthiest people on the wor in the world who any normal industry would sit like academic deans, ensconced in large offices, protected by oaken, oaken desks, enjoying all the perquisites of, of space that their power has made possible. And here they are, such wealthy men, on top of each other. They're sweating on each other, they're getting guacamole on each other, if Michael Lewis is meant to be believed on this. You know, why are they putting up with this? They're doing this, of course, because knowledge is more important than space, right? And in their industry, knowledge trumps everything. And that, in some sense, is why the city has come back. Because knowledge is more important than space. And if you want an example of, of knowledge and space that I just love, go to the, the anatomy lesson room in, in the old one, in, in the museum here, which is wonderful because it just shows how crammed people are around a single location because they want to see the bodies that are being cut up. There aren't even chairs there because they would get rid of the proximity. Right? Knowledge travels most sharply over, over short distances, and it still does. And, and that partially explains you know, the paradox with which I started. Because what globalization and new technologies have done is they have vastly increased the returns to being smart. We have literally hundreds of studies 
documenting the rise and returns to skill in the U.S. and throughout the world. Whether or not this is to do with technology or other economic forces, I'm not going to take a stand right now. But the point of the matter is that being smart is more important than ever. And certainly being wildly creative right, can make you far more of a fortune because you can sell it on the other side of the planet, because you can source it on the other side of the planet. We are a social species. We get smart by being around other smart people. If being smart is more important than being in the center of smart people, is going to be more important. That's why face-to-face -face learning in places like Uppsala isn't going to go out of style anytime soon, no matter what MOOCs show up. And that's why cities aren't going to go out of style anytime soon. The more complicated an idea is, the easier is it, for, is, it is to get lost in translation. Anyone who's ever taught knows the hard part about teaching is not knowing your subject material. It's knowing whether or not anything you're saying is getting through. And we have evolved over millions of years to have these wonderful cues for communicating comprehension or confusion that are lost when we're not in the same room with one another. This is why face-to-face -face contact still matters. This is why the cities that enable that contact still matters. Now, uh, new technologies, in fact, often help cities rather than go against it. This is Zipcar. There's some Swedish equivalent, right? Some car sharing thing where you put, it, you put in money and you get to share, share the car. Um, Zipcar has trumpeted itself as the harbinger of a sharing economy, as if this is something new. And I don't mean to take anything away. I think Zipcar is great. There's nothing new about a sharing economy, right? Cities have always been about sharing economies. What is an urban restaurant but a shared dining room and a shared kitchen? What is an urban park but a shared backyard, right? But there used to be more technological limits on what you could share. Why didn't you have a zip car where the car just sat there and you picked it up in New York in the 1970s? Because you'd go there on a Sunday morning and there'd be like a dead body in the trunk. Right? And you wouldn't know who left the dead body there. It'd be really bad because you'd have to like, call the cops. Um, uh, and and it, you wouldn't want to do this thing. But now they've got all the technology. You knew the last person who did it. You've got the GPS system. So that you're not going to find a dead body there anymore. And as a result, you can share the car. Um, now, of course, when you think about the human capital that matters in cities, only some of it is the human capital that's taught in school. In fact, I'm typically shocked when anything I have to say to students has any real world value whatsoever. Um, but it's the stuff that's learned on city streets. It's exactly what Marshall was talking about. And when you think about the talents, the skills that are most important for urban resurgence, for urban success, I can think of nothing that is more valuable than the talent and inclination to be an entrepreneur. 50 years ago, the economist Ben Chinitz was comparing New York and Pittsburgh. And he, he noted that New York was more resilient than Pittsburgh was even then. And he argued that this was a result of New York's culture of entrepreneurship, a culture that had been created by this garment industry by an industry in which anyone with a good idea could get started if, with a couple of sewing machines. And so this industry became a mother of entrepreneurship, a place that produced business people who might start sewing dresses, but then would find some new opportunity. They would build skyscrapers. They would start movie studios, right? Because entrepreneurial human capital is fungible because it looks for new opportunities wherever it finds it. And these entrepreneurs have been crucial in enabling New York to readapt itself time and time again. By contrast, Pittsburgh had U.S. Steel. U.S. Steel was, like General Motors, a phenomenally productive company in the short run. But U.S. Steel did not train entrepreneurs. It trained company men who made sure the factories operated well. Right? These guys are not good at looking for new opportunities when steel goes down. It's not the right form of human capital. It is remarkable, given how mediocre our measures of entrepreneurial human capital are, that they do so well in predicting urban, urban success. This is one measure, which is average establishment size. And I'm showing you across metropolitan areas the link between average establishment size. And this is true, of course, within regions, within cities, within industries. Um, an enormous robust fact, it's true if you use things like the presence of, of mines in 1900 to provide exogenous variation in how many entrepreneurs there are, and it's true with many other measures of entrepreneurship as well. All sorts of skills matter. I'm going to skip over that. Now, the most entrepreneurial place and planet I've ever been is the Dharavi slum of Mumbai. You walk through its streets and you see a cluster of guys and they're recycling boxes and that means you chop open the box and you turn it out and you re-staple re it so no one can see the, the old labels. And then you go a little bit further and there's an area, a ceramics cluster, where people are making these beautiful pots and they're so proud of them they won't even take any money from you for them. And a little bit further down there's an area of plastic recycling and there's a uh, brassiere making area and you feel like you're in the Lower East Side of Manhattan in 1905. And you just leave this and you just feel just overwhelmed by the promise of Indian entrepreneurship and Indian human capital. And then you walk out in the street and you see a kid defecating in an unpaved road. 
right? And you know, the water isn't good to drink and the electricity is unreliable. And it reminds you that there are also demons that come with density. If two people are close enough to give each other a good idea, they're also close enough to give each other a contagious disease. And if someone's close enough to sell you a newspaper, they're close enough to pick your pocket, they're close enough to mug you. And for thousands of years, cities have been battling the downsides of density. In a sense, an abundance of land hides many sins. But when you cram people together in a place like Mumbai, you really see the failures of government. And that's exactly what's going on in that poor world, those poor world megacities. In places like Kinshasa, that are both poor and poorly governed, you feel all of the downsides of density in these areas. Um, now, the, I'm going to skip over this. I'm going to skip over that. It's government infected. There's a lot of ineffective, highly urbanized countries like Uganda, Afghanistan, and so forth. Now, the downsides of density were also problems for the wealthy world as well. And there are solutions, but they can also be, often be very difficult and very expensive. Um, this is the path of death rates in New York City over the past 200 years. A boy born in New York City in 1900 had a life expectancy that was seven years less than the, than the national average. That's about the same gap between London and the rest of England in the time of Shakespeare. Um, today, life expectancy is about three years longer in New York than the rest of the country. No one fully understands why death rates are lower for older New Yorkers. Some people credit walking, some people credit social connection. We can't rule out selection of healthier people into the city. Among young people, though, it's really obvious. Lower rates of motor vehicle accidents, lower rates of suicide. Right, both, both are much stronger. But the health of New York didn't happen by accident. America's cities and towns were spending as much on clean water at the start of the 20th century as the federal government was spending on everything except for the post office and the army. These were enormously expensive things, and I don't see a way of dealing with clean water in the developing world, and that's something I'm working on right now is clean water in Zambia, that doesn't involve very significant expenditures, almost surely by the public sector. Some things, like the Croton Aqueduct that brought clean water into New York, require massive expenditures on infrastructure. Other problems of the cities do not. Um, you can't just build your way out of traffic congestion. And this is something the economists Gilles Durantan and Matthew Turner have called the fundamental law of highway traffic, which is that statistically, vehicle miles traveled increase roughly one for one with highway miles built. That just means if you double the number of roads, you double the number of drivers and miles that those drivers are driving on the roads. Right? If you build it, they will drive it. Right? There will be a behavioral response. And I think that just points out the wisdom of what the economist Bill Vickery was talking about 50 years ago. If there's a scarce commodity, you want to price it. And indeed, Singapore, for 40 years, has been using congestion pricing with fees that differ by time of day. Right? And that has meant that the second densest country on the world right, has streets that move swiftly, even during prime hours. Now, I don't need to preach congestion pricing in Sweden because, in fact, Stockholm was a pioneer on this, and the politics of how Stockholm did it is a particular lesson for actually much of, much of the world. So I'm going to skip on from this, but the point of the matter is that you've got to be smart both about economics and engineering. I'm going to skip over that. Uh, I don't have time. But if cities are able to deal with these downsides of density, they can be places of remarkable pleasure as well as productivity. Right? The same urban entrepreneurship, the same urban innovation that leads to great city software companies leads to great restaurants. The fact that you have a larger urban population enables you to share the fixed costs of things like museums or parks or other things that are great urban joys. And of course, perhaps the most fun thing about cities is the fact that you can connect with other people. The reason why cities are full of young single people is that young single people want to be close to other young single people. Right? It has been so forever. Right? And cities enable that, that to happen. And connecting in cyberspace, no matter what you may have read on Facebook, will never connect, compare really with sharing a meal or a kiss or a smile. Um, okay, now, the downside of ur urban success can mean that cities become unaffordable. And if they don't build enough, if they, don't, if they restrict their supply too much, they can become boutique towns that are affordable only to the wealthy. This shows the declining line is the number of new, new buildings in Manhattan, the number of new permits. The rising line is rising prices. Just when New York City became more attractive, when its crime rates fell, it made it more and more difficult to build. Um, this is, these are all things showing that supply and you can't repeal the laws of supply and demand, right? If you make things hard to build, if you restrict the supply of something, you make things expensive. And this is the area in which Jane Jacobs, who was in so many ways a peerless observer of urban life, it's what she got wrong. Because she looked at new buildings and noticed that they were expensive, and old buildings and noticed that they were cheap. And this led her to conclude that the way to promote affordability was, not, was to make sure that no one built any new buildings on top of old buildings. 
Okay, that's not how supply and demand works. And you don't have to look any further than her own neighborhood of Greenwich Village, which she fought so hard to preserve as a historic preservation district, essentially freezing the community in amber, right, to see how this operates. Greenwich Village was affordable in the 1950s when she lived there. Now, townhouses like the one she lived in start at $8 million, right? Preserving Greenwich Village may have aesthetic value, I'm the son of an architectural historian. I believe very strongly that many of our oldest buildings are treasures that should be protected, that can bring great life and great beauty to a city. No one is talking about tearing down the old city of Stockholm and putting up skyscrapers there. But let's not pretend that there aren't trade-offs. Every time you say no to a new project, every time you delay it, you are making it harder for new families to move into the city who want to, and you're making it more expensive for those people who want to live it. This graph is just showing that with more regulations, prices go up. This graph is showing the places that build a lot aren't expensive, and the places that are expensive don't build a lot. Um, now, last point, and I'll, I'll end on this. And I will just say that these over-regulation of housing markets, it's unfortunate in Paris, it's unfortunate in Stockholm, it's unfortunate in New York. It is tragic in Mumbai. Mumbai has had a one and a quarter floor area ratio for much of the last 50 years. This is a city that desperately needs height, it needs pedestrian densities, it needs pedestrian infrastructure, and to artificially restrict to garden le city level densities is absurd. And it leads to a city that is completely dysfunctional. And uh, one of the reasons why I, I think I'm so passionate about making sure that we don't pose regulatory barriers, and again, just to be clear, I'm not arguing that everyone should live in a skyscraper at all. I'm just arguing for less regulation for those people who want to build them and want to, want to live in them. Um, one of the reasons why I think we should be friendly for density, for, for allowing this, is that in fact, cities also have an environmental role to play. That cities are often depicted as being the arch enemy of the environment. But in fact, the opposite is really true. And I'd like to illustrate this point with a story about a young Harvard College graduate who on a beautiful spring day in 1844 went for a walk in the woods outside of Concord, Massachusetts. And he did a little fishing, and the fishing was good because there hadn't been much rain lately. But when he came to cook the fish into a soup, the wind flicked the flames to the nearby dry grass, and a fire started, and it spread, and it spread, and by the time it was done, it was a raging inferno that had burned down more than 400 acres of prime woodland. In his own day, he was castigated as an enemy of the environment. The Concord Freeman, the local paper, called him a flibberty gibbet. I don't know how to translate that into Swedish, uh, but, uh, which I think was pretty bad. And indeed, it's hard to think of anyone living at his own age who, of, you know, of that time period, who did as much damage to the environment as he did. Now, today, of course, he is somewhat oddly revered as the secular saint of American environmentalism. His name is Henry David Thoreau, and his book, Walden, preaches a gospel of what a wonderful thing it is to live surrounded by nature. Now, you know, it may have been good for Thoreau to live surrounded by nature. The book has certainly sold a few copies. Uh, but it sure as heck doesn't seem good for nature for Thoreau to live there. And indeed, when I, I look at Thoreau's story, I read a different moral, which is that we are a destructive species. And if you love nature, you should stay away from it. As indeed, Thoreau would have done a great deal of good for nature if he had stayed home in Cambridge instead of cooking chowders in the woods. Now, there's a statistical comparison with that. To to, together with uh, UCLA environmental economist Matthew Kahn, we've tried to figure out the carbon emissions associated with living in different parts of the US. And this is just carbon emissions from the household sector. And we have controlled for income and family size. And uh, what this you know, map shows you right, is the places that look brown are green, and the places that look green are, are brown. These, the redder areas are those areas with higher carbon emissions, higher social costs from this. And you know, I learned this personally when I started acquiring small children about uh, 10 years ago. Only economists talk about acquiring small children. When I started acquiring them, uh, I moved from about here, where I was perfectly parsimonious in my energy use, to about here, and I started doing what with the driving and the larger house and the copious energy use, about as much damage to the environment as, as Thoreau was. Um, these are numbers from our paper. Uh, I don't have time to say that. But the point is that if the great growing economies of India and China see their per capita carbon emissions rise to that seen in the sprawling United States, global carbon emissions go up by 130%. If they stop at the level seen at wealthy but hyperdense Hong Kong, global carbon emissions go up by less than 30%. 130%, 30%. We all have a lot to gain by Hong Kong, by, by India and China building up rather than building out, right? And eliminating policies that artificially restrict the freedom of people who actually just want to build up, who want higher density living, would seem to be something that we could do on this. Now, I don't want to end on this note, because the, I'm well aware of the enormous challenges that are faced both by the planet, by the economy, 
uh, by the cities of the developing world. I do believe in the case of the environment, as in the case of long-term joblessness, as in the case of, of secular stagnation, whether or not it exists, I believe that cities are more likely to be part of the solution than, than, the, than the problem. I believe that urban labor markets are the most likely place where we're going to figure out how to find service sector jobs for less skilled uh, workers. I believe that cities are most likely to come up with the new innovations that will, that will increase our growth rate, and I think certainly cities are likely to do something good for the environment rather than bad for it. But the most important role of cities, and the thing that should, you know, that always makes me optimistic, is the urban ability to enable us to, to invent, discover, create new ideas. And that's really what matters about them. And that ability of cities to enable these collaborative chains of creativity is just magical. And I don't think that's going away. And I think all of us who have ever been in a university who are aware of how much we learn from our colleagues, how dependent we are on the people around us, right, have got to realize how powerful face-to-face -face contact can be for making us smarter, making us more creative, making our lives better. And so I look forward to the chance for, for, to learn from you in the next ha half an hour. And thank you for your time. Sorry, sorry, I went over. Sorry, I went over.